This is the Resilient Disciples Podcast, powered by Awana. I'm Ross. You know who you are. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Uh, I am so excited for this conversation today because I am joined by Dr. Carl Truman, as well as uh, Awana's very own Mike Handler. Uh, so Dr. Truman, hello, and Mike, welcome back. That's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So I want to just jump in, you know, Dr. Truman, you are the professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College in Pennsylvania. Uh, you've written probably over a dozen books, many books that people are aware of, such as The Rise and Fall of the Modern Self. But your new book, Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Spark the Sexual Revolution is now available. I would highly encourage if you are watching this or if you're listening and you're driving, check out the show notes wherever you're listening so you can learn more about Dr. Truman. But I want to start with sort of the framing that you set up in the rise and fall of modern self, which is essentially to ask, how did we get here? You know, by calling it that you've inherently applied that there is a modern self, which is different than perhaps and a more historical self. Um, and I'm just, you know, people are, we're at this moment where so much feels uncertain, so much feels out of control. And I'm just curious how you articulate the, how we've arrived at this point. Yeah, it's a complicated story, and it's one that's not easy to, to sort of boil down. But if I could give one kind of single you know, spine or backbone of the narrative, I would say we live in a world where really over the last three or 400 years, we've increasingly come to what I would say authorize the inner self. What do I mean by that? Well, we've, we've come to put more and more emphasis upon how we feel on our inner psychologies determining who we are. Uh, the most extreme example of that would be, say, the trans moment. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about, if, if you were to go to a doctor, you've used this illustration in numerous talks, if you go to a doctor 150 years ago and say, the doctor, I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, uh, the doctor would have said to you, well, it's a problem of, of the mind. We need to bring the mind into coordination with the body, because the doctor would not cross the doctor's mind that your body was not you. Right. that your body was something added to you. Whereas today, if you go to the doctor and, and uh, say that, the doctor is almost certainly going to say, in fact, maybe legally obliged to say, uh, that's a problem of the body. We need to bring the body into line with the mind, with who you really are. So if you look at that as an example, that gives you uh, a sort of insight into what the modern self really prioritizes feelings. Whereas if you'd grown up, say, in medieval Europe and, and somebody had asked you, who, who are you? You would have used external markers. You'd have said, yeah. well, I, I belong to this village. I'm the son of that person over there. I was baptized in that church. Uh, the, the markers you'd have used for understanding who you are would all have been, we might say, prior to you, independent of you. Mm -hmm. You'd have thought of yourself in an external kind of way. But it, it seems as though, you know, you bring up, uh, you bring up markers from 150 years ago, from even before that with medieval Europe, it seems as though that, that rate or the pace by which we've gotten to where we are ha has accelerated in some regards. Uh, in your book, you talk about expressive individualism, you know, and, and to, to kind of give uh, a little bit more to what you were saying there, it, it's more about who I am and less about everything else around me. Can you, can you unpack a little bit more for us as well about expressive individualism and the role that it plays in even how maybe this rate or pace of change within the public yeah. perception of things has maybe accelerated a bit? Yeah. Well, expressive individualism is a term used by, uh, uh, for example, the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor to talk about this idea that who you are is really that which you feel inside and in order to be truly you you need to be able to express outwardly in the context of society that which you feel inwardly uh, it's where the language of authenticity comes from we talk these days mm. often about you know somebody's an authentic person what do we mean by that well we really mean that that they express outwardly that which they are Inwardly, when you read, for example, the interview that uh, Bruce, now Caitlyn Jenner, gave to Diane Sawyer in about 2015 concerning uh, you know, his transition from being the man Bruce to being the woman Caitlyn, the language there is very much the language of now I'm free to be myself, yeah. I'm free to be the person who I always have been. What, what Bruce Jenner is saying there is now I'm free to act publicly 
in a way that that I think I've always felt inwardly. So that's expressive individualism. Where does it come from? Well, it has an intellectual genealogy that goes way back. I, in, in my books, I typically start with Rousseau, the 18th century Genevan philosopher. One could start before Rousseau. When you write a history book, you're always aware that wherever you start, there was always a backstory. <laughs> but Rousseau is useful because, A, he writes very clearly about this kind of idea, and B, he's proved very influential in things like educational theory, child-centered learning, where the focus of education is to allow the child to grow into the person they already are in some ways, to express mm -hmm. themselves. That looks back uh, to, to Rousseau for its, its cue. Rousseau is the man who... I suppose in some ways most beautifully articulates the idea that you are born you yeah. and society squeezes you into its mold. It's a sort of version of the it's society that screws you up kind of idea with which <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're all familiar today. Mm -hmm. Now, Rousseau's, uh, you, you might say, well, you know, nobody reads Rousseau today or certainly you, know, you watch the television and you see all these expressive individualists floating around None of them have read Rousseau. Oprah Winfrey has never read Rousseau. Kim Kardashian never read Rousseau, let alone my next door neighbor. Well, the thing about expressive individualism is that the idea can be communicated not simply through arguments, but through the way I would say the world is mediated to us. And, and technology plays a big part in this. Uh, technology has increasingly encouraged us to imagine ourselves as individuals who stand at the center of a universe that's there to be instrumental to our happiness. Yeah. Uh, give an example of music. Uh, music provides a, a first class example of how technology has changed, how we relate to the world. 200 years ago, if I'd wanted to enjoy music, I would either have had to have produced it or have been in the company of people who were producing it or be part of a group that was producing it. I love live music. One of the high points of being a college professor is I get to go to the concerts the college puts on. But most of the time, I experience music as an individual on my terms today. Yeah. I've got Spotify. I've got my cell phone that plays by Bluetooth into my ears. I choose the tracks. Play. You know, the, the concept album is dead. I would say the students, yeah. there can never be another Pink Floyd because now ah. we can choose the tracks and we choose the order we listen to them uh, in. Uh, think about what that does. That, that's one small part of what makes me imagine that I'm kind of sovereign. Mm. It's me at the center of things and everything else should be controllable by me. And that kind of world makes expressive individualism very powerful because what it does is it, it leads me to think that external authorities are not particularly decisive on who I am. It's here. It's the desires. It's the passions. It's the impulses that I feel that really constitute who I am. And I think that's so critical because one of the things I'm mindful of, particularly for our audience, which is primarily those who have connections to children's ministry directly, right? We, we want to be the child discipleship partner of choice for the local church. And I think sometimes there's probably some of you who are even listening to this who may hear some of Dr. Truman's points about uh, human sexuality and may get a little squeamish. And that's okay because that is a American culture thing. That is a whole nother podcast. But this idea of I am sovereign, that is the world that our kids are growing up in. And I'm curious, Dr. Truman, how you begin to articulate the urgency of conversations yeah. like this, not yeah. just specific to sexual human sexuality, but yeah. your, your work engages in a lot of hard conversations that people sometimes want to lean out. And I see you continuing to lean in. Why? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think your point about sexuality is very important because what I want to say is that the, uh, the sexual revolution we're experiencing is merely an idiomatic expression, if I could put it that way, of this deeper revolution of the self. Hmm. We happen to think of our individuality primarily in terms of sexual desire today, but that's almost an accident of history. Uh, hmm. the, the, deeper, the deeper notion of the self as individual and sovereign is not inextricably connected to sexual identity. It happens to be sexual identity happens to be the powerful idiom through which it's expressed. So first of all, I want to say for parents and youth leaders watching is, you know, don't think that necessarily because your kids are behaving themselves sexually, 
their world is not the world of the expressive individual. One of the points mm. I try to make in, the, in, in both my books is we need to be careful as Christians not to adopt that pharisaical, I thank you, Lord, that we're not like other men, like the LGBT yeah. people over yeah. here, uh, or like the gang who you know, bring the woman taken into adultery before Christ, ready to stone her. You know, Christ's response there is very interesting. His response is, you know, let him who hath no sin cast the first stone. He, he'll go on to, to say some hard words to the woman, but his first hard words come in the form of a question to the, the gang, the lynch mob mm-hmm. that's, that's gathered. So I'd want to say to, to, to youth leaders and to parents, you need to be aware this is problem is, is way beyond the sexual problem. Mm-hmm. It's a problem generally of how we relate to the world around us. And that's why I think it's important uh, to lean in. And I think we need to realize that it's hard, if not impossible, to avoid this problem. Uh, I, you know, I've chatted to, to Christian parents in the last year who seem to think that, well, we homeschool our kids. Well, great. And that, that might well be a, the right choice for your children. But if you've given them a smartphone, <laughs> then the most influential people in your kids' lives are not you. Yeah. They're the lunatics on TikTok. Uh, so I, I think parents need to realize and need to address these issues on the grounds that the old ways, if you like, of protecting our kids from the evils in the world, they just don't work anymore because lives are much more technological and much more technologically integrated that makes it a much, much more difficult thing. And I think Hmm. part of my burden i feel is simply making parents aware of this it's not it's not the solution but it has to be part of the solution because you cannot solve a problem until you're at least aware that the problem exists no i think that's so critical because i you can hear people and you've had these conversations with folks who will say well you know, I don't have any kids who are transitioning in my youth group or so some of the more very specific and yeah. arguably more extreme examples. But this conversation, every kid in your youth group probably has a smartphone, right? Yeah. The, you know, the it makes this more important and more accessible for people at the same time. And Mike, I want to ask you this about how this relates, excuse me, how this relates, easy for me to say to some of the broader conversations that are going to be experienced at the Child Deception Forum. Generally, you know, Dr. Carl Truman is a faculty member for the Child Deception Forum. We are so grateful. But I know that part of the reason why we have the forum in the first place is simply to gather community around these hard conversations. Yeah, I think it's important. And one of the reasons why we're so grateful for individuals like Dr. Truman, who write extensively on this from a biblical worldview. Uh, One of the reasons why that that matters for us is because we want to equip that local church leader, that parent, that practitioner uh, to be able to have these conversations, to be informed, yes, to be equipped, absolutely, but also to not feel necessarily uh, gripped by fear or totally afraid or overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so at the Child Deception Forum, you'll hear from people like Dr. Truman and others who will speak to what we're experiencing as practitioners in the local church. And we'll do so through three lenses, the first being that of cultural analysis, the second being that of child advocacy, and the third being local church practice. And we feel that when we do those three things together, or at least get a good grip on those, right, uh, we can help, we can have better conversations. We can equip people, uh, including our volunteers, better and more decisively. So we're grateful for that, Dr. Truman. We're grateful for you being a part of that via video with us. It'll be an awesome time together. But you you brought up something that I want to just kind of touch on here for a, a little bit, if you don't mind. And, and that's maybe the Christian's desire at this moment in history to, to want to like peel away, right? To, to, to be protective, to be, to be like, to, to kind of gather around like the desert fathers, if you will, and withdraw. And yet having read your books and, and having spoken with you on this, that's not necessarily the solution, is it? I mean, that's, that's not necessarily the, the thing that we should do here. What, what would you say to that Christian uh, parent or, you know, that, that youth leader or children's ministry leader who says, man, let's just put up the gate, build a big compound and, you know, separate ourselves from the rest of the world. Well, I'd say it, it's virtually impossible to do for a start. And if it's impossible to do, it's not a lot of time, not worth spending a lot of time trying to do it. 
you know, when I was pastor for six years of a church and I had congregants, they had student loans, they had mortgages, they have jobs. Yeah. Uh, it, it, this idea that we can all withdraw into the desert, I think is simply not a practical one. Yeah. Secondly, I don't think it's what Christians are called to do. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the first and second centuries, Paul, Paul, for example, Paul isn't calling on Christians to withdraw from the Roman Empire. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the Roman Empire as it happens. He focuses very much on the gospel. But he, he calls upon Christians to be uh, faithful in their callings within the world and faithful in a, in a way that's shaped by their Christian commitment. So I think the first thing we need to do is there, is, there are a couple of temptations that I think we need to resist at this point in time. One of them it's a pipe dream that we're just going to be able to pull at and protect ourselves. That's, that's not going to happen. Secondly, I think we need to resist the temptation of, of, of becoming very angry or of despairing. I don't think that Christians are called to despair, and I don't think we're called to be angry. I, I can certainly understand why uh, particularly Protestant evangelicals who, who, who feel the country in some ways being stolen from them, can feel that temptation to anger, but but that has to be resisted because the country never, the, the city of man never belonged in some ways to the city of God. We need to realize that just as, as Rome fell in the early fifth century and Augustine had to write his city of God to explain to Roman Christians, the fall of Rome is not the fall of, of, of the kingdom of God. It's just the fall of an earthly city. I think we need to to bear that in mind. What I think we do need to do is we do need strong churches. We need strong churches where uh, there is true community and there is faithful proclamation of the Word of God. Uh, ironically, I think the marginalizing of Christianity may help that because it seems to me that the history of marginal communities and even of the LGBTQ community the history of marginal communities is they tend to be strong communities yeah. because hmm. they have to look after each other, whether it's the Jews in medieval Europe, the Christians in the second century, uh, the nonconformists in England and Britain in the 19th century. Uh, marginality can make communities strong. So I think we, we need to be thinking, and again, strong community might look different in Manhattan to what it does in Western Pennsylvania, to what it does in San Francisco. But we need to be thinking, of how does this moment of marginalization feed into making the church a stronger community? I think the days when we could think of church as the place we go for an hour on Sunday morning and hear the word preached and then forget about it for the rest of the week, that's not going to equip us for, for what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, I think we need, as I mentioned, strong teaching of the Word of God, and we need, uh, we need to make sure that our young people are properly grounded in the Word of God. And I think that's more than just memorizing Bible verses. It's more than just learning the Bible. I, I think one of the, the things that I've come across in chatting to young people at college is they'll ask me a question, what does the Bible teach about gay marriage, something like that? And I'll outline what I think the Bible teaches on such an issue. And, uh, they're good kids. They, you, you point them to the Bible teaching, and that's sort of enough for them. But I also know that for kids today, growing up with, with many gay friends who are, who are nice people, and they get on well with them, and they love them, and they want them to flourish, at the back of their mind, there's going to be that question, yeah, but does God just say that because he wants my gay friends to be unhappy? Mm -hmm. Is it just because he's mean, et cetera, et cetera? And I think in those contexts, it's very helpful for pastors and youth workers and teachers to have some sort of hard statistics at their fingertips. To be able to say, you know, certain lifestyles lead to a proliferation of certain kinds of illnesses, mm -hmm. lower life expectancy, damaged bodies, damaged families. Uh, I, I think the church needs to think more broadly, you know, not supplanting biblical authority with medical statistics. Sure. But showing what the Bible teaches and then demonstrating that actually it makes sense that the Bible teaches this, because when you look at the way the world is, when you break the rules, damage and tragedy uh, mm. follow in quick succession. So I think thinking about not just shouting Bible verses at our young people, but teaching them the whole counsel of God yeah. and then showing them how that actually correlates with with the reality they experience is going to be an important part of what we do. I want to talk about the fact that you're a grandpa, because I think that's, that's helpful to this conversation. <laughs> so I understand that you recently became a grandfather. So I did. All, yes. Congratulations. Thank you very much. 
But one of the things that I've seen in my own father as I, I became a dad is his perspective changed. And I'm curious about how your perspective changed because so many of these conversations that you engage in with that temptation to anger yeah. comes a temptation to sort of win the day. Let's yeah. win this initial yeah. fight. But yeah. there's a longer view, I would imagine, yeah. that comes when you're thinking about this for your grandkid. What does that actually look like? Yeah, well, first of all, you do get a longer view. You know, the, you, when you have kids, you, your worry is for your kids. And you're sort of thinking, what's the world going to be like for the 25 or 30 years they outlive me for in, in the normal mm -hmm. run of things? When your grandchild comes along, you say, man, i got to worry about the next 70 or 80 years now. You, you <laughs> sort of double the, the, the amount you've got to worry about. Um, so there's that. But I think, again, you know, the temptation to despair or panic, we have to put it aside. And one of the things, I don't know if it's directly connected to becoming a grandfather or not, because I think I'd come to this conviction before I actually became a grandfather. Uh, about six or eight months ago, I said to my wife one evening that I'd come to the conclusion that I was probably going to lose every battle I engaged in, in the public square relative to LGBTQ kind of stuff in my lifetime. Hmm. Probably going to lose them all. Now, some listeners may say, well, that's a really despairing picture. But the, the odd <laughs> thing is, it's actually not a despairing picture so much as a liberating one, because it sort of lowers the bar in some ways. <laughs> in that, like you said, OK, I haven't got to win the battle next week. And if I don't win the battle next week, I don't have to despair. Yeah. What I have to do is I have to think about two, three generations down the line. I use an example in class early in it's, it's illustrated a different point, actually, but early in my humanities class at Grove, I will put up a picture on the wall of Cologne Cathedral, which is one of the great Gothic structures of medieval Europe. And it was they started work in 1244. I think they finished work on Cologne Cathedral around about 1888. So it was, you know, sort of 650 years of work, more or less, went into it now. 200 years of that, it was suspended because of the Reformation. So, you know, it might only have taken them 450 years had the work not been interrupted. But one thing is that we know is that on the day that the foundation stone was laid, or the day that the architect first put uh, pen to paper to draw up plans, we know that the, the architect and the men involved in, in the first day of construction, they knew that they would never walk through the doors of Cologne Cathedral to worship there. They would never live to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And yet they considered it worth doing. That's a very unmodern mentality because we like everything pretty instantly today. I think we need to recapture some of that long-term mentality. I mean, I think we see it in Paul. Hmm. When Paul in, in 2 Corinthians, you know, he, there's a lot of grief in Paul's life, and yet there's still great joy there because long-term he's looking to eternal glory. But he's also knowing that everybody has their task to do. Some sow, some water, some are blessed to bring in the harvest. I think we need to think about that in the issues of our day. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to win on the LGBTQ issue. You're probably not going to win. Your, your heart's going to be broken by some of the individuals you see uh, wander away and get destroyed by this stuff. But what you do is still worth doing. I think that needs to be our mentality. I know I'm going to lose, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow the enemy an easy victory. They're going to, have to fight me every, every step of the way. Yeah, sure. And, and my goal is not to win this battle. It's to leave enough behind that generations to come can build and mm -hmm. they'll have something to build. We're in the game of making sure that people remember the people have materials to take hold of and use and to advance uh, into the future. And that's how I think we need to think about our role today. Our task today is we're not going to you know, take over Congress for Jesus next week, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is make sure that our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren are left something yeah. upon which they can build. Now, whether they build upon it is their choice. There's nothing mm -hmm. we can do about that. But we can certainly make sure that we, sleep at night knowing that we have fulfilled our obligation to the best of our ability to generations yet unborn the thing i want to say and this is part of a qualification where i say i'm speaking as me now not necessarily the the opinions expressed by ross cochran aren't necessarily that of a wanna because specific to the lgbtq conversation what i appreciate so much about your perspective there 
is it's also the better conversation than that angered response, than that despair response. It is a more, you know, you said earlier, teaching the whole counsel of God. That is a, in my opinion, a more accurate way to reflect the whole counsel of God in that, I don't say nuanced because it's, it's incredibly biblically convicting, but in a more uh, way that is honoring of God's creation than what you so often see in the marketplace. Yes, I mean, I think anger is, you know, anger is a great consumer good. I mean, if you want to build a following on Twitter or Facebook, you, you know, you've got to be angry and, and you've got to ratchet up the anger. You've got to get more and more angry to, to keep galvanizing your, your base. And that's a bad strategy. Uh, I have always been convinced that, you know, the, what's the best argument for biblical marriage? Good biblical marriages. Yeah. Uh, pos the positive presentation of marriage and this is why you know the church's acceptance of no-fault divorce was such a disaster mm -hmm. that was when the church accepted the redefinition of marriage no we should never have accepted that we should have mm -hmm. we should have uh, said no marriage except in the most extreme circumstances is for life and we as a christian church embody the beauty of those marriages i've had the joy of performing a wedding for a couple of students, uh, former students of mine, just yesterday, I'm sitting at the table at the rehearsal dinner the night before with uh, the parents, the two sets of parents of bride and groom. Uh, my wife and I have been married for coming up 32 years. Hmm. The parents of the groom have been married for 30 years. The parents of the bride have been married for 40 years. And uh, hmm. I made the comment that, wow, to have three random couples brought together today, all of them have just been married once and have been married for decades. Yeah. That's unusual, even in the church. Wow. Yeah. So I, I, I think, again, it goes back to what I said earlier about we need to resist the temptation. Say, so thank you, Lord. I'm not like other men. No, too often we're exactly like other men. <laughs> and therefore, we need to <laughs> repent like those other yeah. men yeah. And we need to take the Bible's teaching seriously and embody it and demonstrate it in our own lives. Yeah. Carl, you, you, uh, you have the local church experience. You yourself said you pastored for six years. Uh, you teach at Grove City, you work with uh, their students, young adults, who most of them are coming from uh, families of faith and all of that. They're, they're these young disciples who are trying to live out their faith uh, on Grove City campus. Uh, can you tell us, uh, maybe elaborate a little bit, if you will, on that kind of difference between that short game and the long game? Discipleship is not instantaneous work, is it? It's not microwave work. No, it's, no. it's the feast that has taken days to prepare, weeks, yeah. months, years to prepare. Can you tell us, uh, maybe this is, I don't know which hat of this is for you. This is your pastoral hat or your professorial hat or yeah. perhaps even your, your patriarchal hat. But uh, <laughs> whichever hat you're putting on, can you, can, you, can you talk to our listeners, to our viewers about that long game of discipleship and yeah. how there is great freedom in the fact that it's not the next tweet I put out or yeah. the, the, the next you know, uh, shot across the bow on social media yeah. that is where the value is. It is in that long game of yeah. discipleship for a culture, not just culture making or culture changing, but I think what you talked on before really has to more do with human flourishing. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, again, there are so many aspects that I'll, I'll just, I'll think about, I'll reflect on two important aspects that first of all, I think discipleship has to be embodied. Hmm. Uh, I, I think our bodies are important. And that's one of the problems I think with social media is that a lot of interaction is now disembodied. Uh, I think that, we, we discovered this during the time of COVID when you know, Grove went online for six weeks. Kids hated it. They absolutely hated it. Education is not sitting, staring at a screen. They came back and they were masked for a year. And that was better than being on screen. But they still hated that because so much of human interaction comes through the face. Yeah. And the face is in some ways who we are. Sure. Uh, so I would say the first thing about discipleship is it's going to be local. It's, it's, it's going to be local. It's the people you rub shoulders with. And my wife and I try to capture some of this relative to Grove in that I try to, we, we try to open our house each semester to all the kids in my classes. That's we awesome. had like, yeah, I think we had 60. I accidentally advertised the one night for all the classes I taught last semester. So we were about 60 kids turn up at our house <laughs> one night. Uh, That's fantastic. But, but my own memories of college are, you know, I hardly remember a lecture. 
but I know stuff, so I must have been in those lectures. What I, rem <laughs> what I remember with, with the 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 one on one times with professors or going to a professor's house, a bit of hospitality. So I think we need to think in, I mean, in embodied terms about uh, discipleship and realize that, yep, yeah, some of the most influential things we say might be said while sharing a coffee, sitting on a deck yeah. with with somebody, with a student. So I think that personal interaction. Uh, it's not social media. It's real people in real space and time interacting that has, uh, that has importance. And that's what I would say, you know, when you're on social media, don't do anything on social media trying to influence somebody that you can never have any influence over that damages the influence you can actually have over the real people that you sit next to in church on a Sunday or you meet in class. Uh, the second thing I would say about discipleship is I, I would say it's analogous to, say, learning a language or learning a musical instrument. Uh, it takes a long time. Hmm. Uh, I, I, for, for many years, I used to get worried that I couldn't remember sermons I'd heard. And then when I preach, I began to realize, oh, man, I can't remember some of the sermons I preach. People say, <laughs> well, what, what, what's your view on this passage? And I say, well, I preached on it. I'll need to go and check my notes and tell you what I actually think. <laughs> uh, but then I remembered at school, I, my, I ended up doing classics at university, and, and my Latin is pretty decent. I remember hardly any Latin lessons at school. But if I pick up a book of Latin poetry, I can make a half decent attempt at reading it, which means I must have been in those lessons. and I must have learned some stuff. And I think that the, the impact of the church, the worship service, it's incremental. Discipleship is something that takes place over a long period of time through the ministry of the church, through the experiences we have in, in daily life as we seek to uh, to pray and to work through challenges and issues we have. But discipleship is, again, like building Cologne Cathedral. You're not sanctified in a day. You don't become a faithful disciple in a day. It's a lifetime's work. Yeah. It takes place over years, and it takes place often imperceptibly in ways that we don't even realize. Mm -hmm. So the basics, the mundane elements of Christian discipleship, Worship, hearing the word preached, reading the Bible, singing God's praise, rubbing shoulders with Christians during the week. All of these things have a, a shaping uh, impact upon us. I really hope people hear the freedom in that. You know, one of the things that I'm always so mindful of, particularly as someone who didn't come from the world of children's ministry directly, is I never want any of these conversations to feel like I'm adding a to-do list item to yeah. the people who are on the ground doing ministry. Yeah. But what you're saying there is the most fruitful work isn't yeah. about how many letters you have after your name. It isn't yeah. about the well-practiced or well-rehearsed line in a sermon. Yeah. It is about, as our CEO, uh, Matt Markins would say, being eye to eye, knee to knee with a yeah. kid yeah. and reflecting who Jesus is to them through who Jesus is to you. Yeah. And I want to make sure, though, especially for folks who have stuck around uh, for our entire conversation up to this point, is that there is an incredible amount of, I'll just say, practicality to your work. That yeah. you're one of the reasons why your work is so accessible is because you read it and you really go, oh, I know how to take that and apply it to my context. And you speak often, You, you uh, people who are at the Child Discipleship Forum, either in person or online, will hear this firsthand. But to give podcast people a little sneak peek, you speak to what folks should do, the sort of practical steps for if they're encountering and engaging in a moment with a kid who is struggling with some level of sexual identity. And I'm curious if you can unpack that for our podcast listeners, sure. excuse me, our podcast listeners specifically. <clears throat> Yeah, well, it, of course, I, I used to find this when I taught at seminary when students would say, what do you do in this pastoral situation? And there's always sort of, well, it's hard to give a general one size fits all because every pastoral situation has its commonalities, but also has its, its unique, you know, the person you're talking to has a unique personality, unique history. I would say as a general principle, uh, listen. Hmm. First of all, hmm. listen to what the kid is saying. Now, that's not to give what they're saying any ultimate authority mm -hmm. but i think what you do when you listen to a child is this one you get a better handle on how they think and why they think the way they do and you also send a signal to them that they count they matter you may not agree with them in the end but you've honored them by giving them time to explain their position to you so the first thing i would say in any situation particularly if a, if a child is wrestling with lgbtq kind of stuff is listen 
uh, there's going to be a background. There's going to be a story to this. This didn't come out of the blue. Yeah. Kids have not always struggled with this. They struggle with it today because of particular pathologies and shapes and, and things that are going on in our society. And uh, I, I give you one example. One, one guy I was chatting to once who, who said to me, you know, my problem is the T. I, I feel I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. And I said, to him, okay, tell me how, how, when, why you started feeling this way. And, and he sort of told me his life story. And by the time he'd finished his life story, it was able to sort of, we were both able to agree. Okay. It's, it's not actually an issue of you being a woman trapped in a man's body. Is it? It's, it's more of an issue of you wanted to belong to the group that was kind to you at school. It was the girls who were kind to you. And, and the only idiom we've given you to try to understand that is that of gender fluidity and identity. Mm -hmm. um, the catastrophic number of girls coming out uh, in, in some places as, as lesbian mm -hmm. or bisexual. Yeah, I'd want to sit and listen to any individual story there. And my guess is that nine times out of 10 for young girls, what you'll be listening to is a story of a girl who finds herself feeling intense feelings of friendship to another girl. And our generation and our society has not given her any category for understanding that other than that of sexual identity. Hmm. We have not taught our young people to understand what friendship is. So I would say uh, on that level, first, the first and important thing to do is, is to listen. Listening, of course, itself uh, will be more powerful if you have established a prior relationship yeah. with the child. So I think good relationships with, with the children is useful. Uh, and that emerges out of a long-term thing. And then I think thirdly, you don't always have to hit people with the gospel every time. Sometimes listening for a long period of time might be the way to go. Now, I'm not saying it always is, but I think you've got to use your wisdom. If you've got a real friendship, real relationship with, with the person you're talking to, you should be able to use your wisdom to know how best to, to approach this person. So I think be wise in the way that you do it as well. And of course, always bear in mind that it doesn't ultimately rest upon your shoulders. Uh, you, you know, you can do, you, you've got to do the right thing. Whether you get the right results, that's not down to you. That's not down to you. And even if you're bringing up your own kids, uh, there's a limit to what you can do with your own kids. The best you can hope for in some ways is to go to bed at night, sleep soundly, because nothing you've done has messed them up. <laughs> uh, that, that's a sort of rather blunt way of putting it, but, but that's, that's not a bad yeah. That's not a bad thing, actually. That mm -hmm. might be, you know, if when I say it's all you can hope for, that's a huge thing to hope. That, that's actually a big thing. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that's perfectly possible from a human perspective. That's good. Yeah. The, the do no harm <laughs> right there for, mm, yeah. for parents is probably a, a really powerful, yeah. and really, and maybe sometimes overlooked type of truth, if you will. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Truman, as we wrap up our time with our listeners and our viewers, um, you, you've mentioned this before, but I really want to make sure that, that we all comprehend it. You know, sometimes it feels like we're standing, not even on the shore and the tsunami is coming, but we're in the midst of it, you know, and it is, it is just chaos yeah. all around us. And the, that ground that we're standing on uh, can feel maybe shaky at best. Yeah. And yet we're, where you are, we are grounded in the truth of the gospel. Can you just as maybe one last note of encouragement, uh, speak to our, our listeners, our viewers about why the message of the gospel, mm. even as it relates to the youngest of hearts yeah. that we, that we go to help uh, bring into a knowledge and a loving, serving mentality of our yeah. Lord Jesus. Why is that message? Why is that so much more powerful, so much more true, so much more real, if you will, than, than the message that our Western culture specifically, but maybe perhaps modern culture as a whole, yeah. is, is pushing toward us? Yeah. Well, there, again, there are a number of ways one could answer that, but I, I'm, I'm just going to zero in on one that I found as, as students at Grove have been particularly receptive to. What does it mean to be a human? 
I think to be a human being, there are two aspects of, of, of being a human being, as, as everybody, believer and unbeliever, experiences it. One, we intuitively find ourselves to be free. We, we make decisions. We're, we're not like, you know, say the students at Grove, the beaver builds a dam. Hmm. The crow makes a nest. But they don't intentionally do that. They instinctively do that. Hmm. Only human beings build bridges. Only human beings design and build homes. We, we understand ourselves as intentional free beings, and yet we also want to belong. It's not enough to be the isolated free individual. We want to belong, and it's hard to tie those two things together because to belong to a community, to belong to one spouse, to be, to be part of something bigger than you involves a sacrifice of freedom. Hmm. We, we have to give something up. And I think when you look at modern society, what's modern society doing? Modern society is throwing away belonging in this pursuit of radical freedom and is finding that that is is leading to nothing but but chaos mm. why the gospel well the gospel answers both of those human longings it answers the freedom and belonging if the sun sets you free you'll be free indeed and yet come to me you who are heavy laden there's a you know there are no lone ranger christians in the new testament everybody belongs to the church and yet the church is where one is free this is why i think the closest analogy to the church is marriage because what is a great marriage a great marriage is where the one partner expresses their freedom by fulfilling the desires of the other because guess what the desires of the other that are that's the desires of both partners yeah so i think the gospel the gospel solves, I mean, the gospel solves all kinds of human problems, but the big question at the moment and the thing that upon, upon which American society is unraveling is this radical pursuit of freedom at the expense of any kind of belonging. And the gospel answers that question. If you like, American culture is asking the right question, it, but it's coming up with a catastrophic answer. And that's what gives me hope for the church, because I think if the church models true community, then the church will be an attractive place mm. for the shattered people who found that this radical freedom doesn't work. And of course, the church has the promises. We know that's one of the reasons why the gospel is, is the truth. That is so good and a perfect place to end our conversation. Dr. Truman, thank you so much uh, for the time. Thank you so much for uh, your ministry and being willing to share with our community. Uh, Mike Handler, thank you so much for the time as well. Don't want to leave, don't want to leave you out on that, but, uh, uh, and thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. And, uh, we'll talk to you again soon.